Um, right. Okay, I'll, I'll yes. allow you to introduce, introduce right. me, sorry. Wonderful, all right. Well, uh, thanks everyone who's listening in, both uh, right now and then in subsequent, subsequent hearing. Um, this is the final session on the expert stage of our Hack From Home. Over the last couple of days, we've been looking at how personal data can be used in decarbonization. So uh, looking at a range of behavioral incentives and changes that can be promoted, how and why and where, looking at considerations around uh, the energy system as a whole, smart grids, the future of heat, a whole range of particular trends. At the same time, our project teams have been hard at work developing their ideas, which will be submitted uh, to the prize competition later tonight after, of course, being given the chance to get grilled by our resident entrepreneurial dragon, Professor Irene Ung. For the last talk, we have one of our fellow delivery partners on the Eastern New Energy Grant, uh, Chris Ivory from ARU, coming to speak to us about uh, slow computing, giving us a, a different perspective upon some of the decarbonization problems and computational problems that we've been discussing today. So, Chris, over to you. Yeah, well, thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, so I'm going to step out of character a little bit for a business school professor and talk about the way in which uh, computing is culpable in um, carbon consumption and carbon footprints. Um, I've been writing something recently and I'm going to talk about that. It's not fully formed, so it's more in the, in the form of a polemic, I think, and something to uh, discuss. I hope not to take too much of your time and we can have a discussion about it after, which would be great. So I want to talk about uh, deep and surface environmentalism and I want to talk a little bit about something called uh, eco-Marxism or my sort of take on that, if you like. And I'm going to do that through the medium of computing and the problems with it and what we can do about it. So it's clear that um, computing has been something of a disappointment starting back in the 1970s with uh, the sort of responsible technology movement. There was this idea that computing would be this wonderful um, window onto um, you know, information and knowledge which would underpin democracy and you know, individual citizens taking easy part in democratic decisions and the diffusion of knowledge and information. And it hasn't really uh, worked like that. It's been slightly disappointing, as Langdon Winner uh, tells us, that uh, computing has been kind of taken over and shaped by very particular centers of power after very particular interests. And these interests have been largely around accelerating uh, consumption. And there's some writing around this, which is um, highlighting the concerns that we should have about this. And one of these movements is called slow computing. So I'm going to start with that and then move on to some sort of bigger thinking about sort of uh, deep environmentalism and how these implicate. So, well, what is slow computing? Well, it's really a response to accelerated computing and the effects that computing has on our lives. It's quite obvious that a number of devices, uh, computer laptops themselves, but also handheld devices, which seem to be the serial offenders here, have really co colonized our lives and they've crashed through the, the home work-life boundary, they've led to work intensification, you know, the always on culture, the always available culture, not only to work, but also to our friends and family. Um, this has led to work intensification and th th this technology is also underpinning what we call uh, the gig economy, which is uh, the sort of casualization of work. Uh, you don't have any rights, et cetera, et cetera. You have no pension, you become an independent trader. So it's this frictionless um, economy, this, these frictionless employees, if you like, that the capitalists have always dreamed of. And that's becoming true. It's still a small part of the economy, but it's, a, it's an increasingly important part of the economy. I think we're all um, aware of it. So that's, so that's one side of the, the acceleration of life. Um, but what has this got to do with uh, decarbonizing, which is where my thinking has stepped away from this a little bit. So it's, it's kind of obvious, isn't it, that uh, these devices themselves use quite a lot of energy and the more you're using them, the more energy they consume, not only in themselves uh, through needing to charge their batteries or plug them in, but also through the lighting of servers up uh, around the planet. And a recent estimate that I saw was that, uh, that these devices consume about three, well, they, they produce about 3.7% of our carbon footprint. So, you know, so much for the paperless office, you know, saving the forests, actually we have a carbon footprint of 3.7%, which is about the same as air travel, which is, which is quite extraordinary. I know you had a talk yesterday from uh, Professor Yu Zhong, also on blockchain. And uh, I'm sure he mentioned the fact that uh, Elon Musk has said that he'll no longer accept 
bitcoins uh, for uh, the purchase of his cars because of the energy consumption of creating bitcoins. And it just seems an extraordinary sort of thing for a guy who's building rockets to be worried about uh, blockchain. But there you go, that's the, the, the contradictions of the system we live in. But I think at a deeper level, the big problem with these devices, and this is also part of the, the concern of uh, slow computing and slow computing enthusiasts, is, um, and we touched upon this in the, in the last presentation as well, is the way in which they promote consumption. And it's these centers of power and you know, the likes of Google, for example, and Amazon, um, and even Netflix, if you want to include those as well. Their focus is on getting us to consume more. And these devices are becoming horribly uh, good at that. If you read uh, Zuboff's uh, Surveillance Capitalism, for example, you know, she shows how these devices are increasingly designed, um, you know, as you flick through news feeds and Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. They're literally designed to keep you there looking and using the device. So this has implications for health. You know, you take the thing to bed, it interferes with your relationships, et cetera, et cetera, which is one of the concerns of slow computing. But it also leads, and this is my concern, to a increase in consumption. And the reason it does that, of course, you know, the reason that Google wants to keep you addicted to your smartphone, and it literally is addicted. I mean, you know, the sort of surveillance capitalists draw the lessons of Skinner and behaviorism. They draw the lessons for Las Vegas and even some of the findings of the CIA in behavior change. And we've seen the whole kind of nudge thing. It all comes from that. And they're building this into, these, uh, into our smartphones to get us hooked, to get us to stay there, because when we do that, because they're collecting all of the uh, behavioral surplus of our, our data searches and building up profiles about us. What they do is then, of course, and I'm sure you're aware of this for the most part, they package us up. We, as Zuboff says, we become the product. So it's us, knowledge about us and our interests, and the fact that we're looking at a particular news item at a particular time. And one of the things that happens, which I find fascinating, is that, that within microseconds, this fact that you're there looking at a, news, uh, a newspaper article, the fact that you have certain interests which are already known is then packaged up and auctioned and various automated um, advertisers bid for that little bit of space. They win it and they can then target an advert directly at you, okay, which is uh, it's quite extraordinary. So the only purpose here is consumption. That's you know, what this whole cycle of addiction, advertising, sales is kind of locking us into. And cities are doing this as well. You know, they're following us around in cities, they're following us around. Uh, they know where we are, they know what our interests are if they want to sell that data on. And uh, they know who we're in proximity with and what shop we're standing outside of. So this is, you know, there's a lot of policing issues uh, here as well, a lot of uh, surveillance interest from the government, but massive interest from advertisers. So this is driving up consumption. So what can we do about this? Well, the slow computing has uh, movement does have some answers to this. On the first level, on the surface level, if you like, this is the idea that we can enact a sort of personal hygiene. So we can do things ourselves. We can carve out time during the day where we don't use our devices, so we're not exposed to them. We can leave them at home. We can certainly not take them to bed, as I keep telling my children. And uh, of course, they don't listen to me. Um, so it's a sort of personal hygiene thing. We can engage with our friends and family and tell them that we're going to be on our phones less. We can drop Facebook. Um, we can drop other social media. So we can take our own action to step away from this and pull ourselves away from this constant uh, advertising. And just about, just about the cleverness of the advertising of it, it's, you know, some of it at the minute is pretty stupid. I was, uh, about a year ago, I was um, sent an advert for my own book. It's, uh, Amazon thought I might be interested in this. I hadn't noticed the fact that I was a second author and yeah. So it can be pretty dumb, but it's also extremely clever and getting smarter you know, through AI, etc. You know, uh, Netflix probably knows more, for example, about your viewing habits than, than you actually do because it collects such a huge amount of data on your behavior. It knows when you start a program, how often you stop it. It knows how long you watch things for. It knows if you binge things. It knows what sort of things you binge. It knows what time of the day or night you will do that. So it starts to build up a pattern which you, you, you could, couldn't possibly do for yourself unless you kept a fantastic record. So it knows when you will tend to watch things and your smartphone and advertisers are getting just as good at this as well. So it is pretty, it's pretty insidious. And I think we need to write more about this and talk more about this as uh, Shoshona Zuboff has done, for example. Uh, and the key thing here, um, as Adam Curtis uh, says, is we have become the product. Our job 
is uh, no longer to work really even. We don't really need to work right with automation. Our job is actually to consume. That's the role we're taking as citizens. And we need to push back against that. So what's the, what's the deeper level here that I want to talk about? Um, well, first of all, let's talk about the stage that we are in, um, not just in Western capitalism, but in terms of the industrial revolution itself. Um, don't be fooled uh, by the likes of uh, Schumpeter and Zuboff, who tell us that there are various technology waves which come and go, and, and digital technology is one such wave that will propel our economies upwards, cause investment, etc., etc., or attract investment, lead to better lives, etc. Um, what seems to be happening, in fact, is that our economies around the world are slowing down. One of the problems for manufacturing is uh, not that manufacturing is being sent abroad or that all the money is going into services and property. Um, it's the fact that they actually have overcapacity. Actually, we don't want to consume the amount of products that they can presently produce. So there's overcapacity in engineering. Um, other suggestions of slowdown, we all probably know that population um, expansion is beginning to decelerate. That's happening, and a lot of these ideas come from um, Danny Dawling's book, Slow Down. You should really read this book. I think it's very important. Um, other indicators of this, the returns on technology investments are declining. They have been since the 1970s. Um, I think you've got about 2.8% sort of or 2.7% average across a decade on your return in the 1970s up to 2019. In that decade, it was already down to 1.2%, and it's been declining steadily ever since. So what this tells us is that, um, oh, other factors as well, um, there's less knowledge being produced. There's more knowledge around the same things, but there's less new knowledge being produced when you actually do an analysis of the data that's, you know, what's being published. So there's a sort of slowdown in knowledge production. There's a slowdown in technology innovation. Uh, so we're coming to a quite a vulnerable point of what your potential permanent stagnation um, in all of our economies globally. And my suggestion, and uh, certainly Dali Dawling's uh, suggestion, is this is a good thing because um, if we're consuming less or we learn to consume less, we learn to live well with less, this is a positive thing. So my call to entrepreneurs and to ideationists and creatives is to get involved in this slowdown, you know, stick a stick in the spoke of the wheel of consumption and perpetual economic growth. And I think we can start our thinking with a slowdown idea, which is to withdraw from these uh, devices, to lessen our exposure to advertising. But I think we can also use these devices as well. Um, I think Ian's talk uh, touched on this uh, to some extent, which was great to see. We can use these devices to, uh, and we can use AI to actively encourage us to consume less. So the sort of innovation that I'm sort of thinking about is, um, you know, can we have AI on our phone, for example, which looks at our purchasing behavior, looks at our behavior, keeps that data to us, and then figures out when we're kind of um, likely to make a purchase? You know, is it about when we get around, when we get paid? You know, is it around different sort of bio cycles when we kind of need cheering up or what you know what is it you know and can it warn us that we're vulnerable to purchasing something we don't need can it provide us information on the carbon implications of that purchase indeed the carbon implications of just using uh, our mobile devices themselves so i'm kind of i'm looking for innovation and i'm looking for entrepreneurship which is no longer going to con contribute to the the fallacy of perpetual economic growth but is actually going to contribute to um, the idea of slow down perpetual stagnation and learning to live uh, differently within that um, and to shift our cultural expectations and our cultural feeling that if you're not able to buy a bigger house or a better car that you've somehow failed in life you know what can we do to address that because we are in a culture war here as well as you know and, and the, you know, the evidence that our states are getting quite desperate is, uh, is, is evident as well. I mean, the whole idea, you know, I, I don't want to knock universal basic income, but this is clearly a mechanism to keep consumption and economic growth going because of course they don't care about these people who are living in poverty. What they care about is that they're not, they're, they're, they're not and cannot consume. Um, so, you know, they've tried cheap money, they've tried printing money. That is increasingly not working. We're not consuming in the way that we used to. UBI is a, perhaps a next step to say, well, can we fix it that way? 
but let's bring the era of consumption to an end and let's uh, let's be part of that and for in, in a new form of uh, entrepreneurship a genuinely disruptive uh, entrepreneurship one that actually disrupts the uh, investment consumption uh, investment production consumption consumption uh, cycle it was a bit of a polemic um, i hope that's okay and yeah i've said all i want to say well thank you very much for that um lots uh lots to think about there Teresa, can you switch pop back on my video first um anyway it doesn't really matter um yeah no that was really interesting i uh i found i had a, a few different questions there um you outlined a world wherein you would like to see new systems come into being that help realign the choices that people make either on a day-to-day -day basis or what, what perhaps more broadly the choice about how they structure their life so then you know pipe down the decisions that they make on a day-to-day -day basis in your work in anglia ruskin and the business school either amongst yourself your colleagues or perhaps more broadly in other uh, institutions doing similar work have you come across any initiatives uh, any business ideas uh, or just broader broader term of initiative uh, that would seek to have stuff that you could characterize as slow computing kind of change it's a, it's it's a, it's a great uh, question i mean that there have been some small initiatives so, i mean the, the the discourse the sort of managerial narrative at the minute is around health and well-being um so somehow you know that if we are unhealthy we're not going to be productive at work and they can see that logic so there have been some attempts to protect us from the invasiveness of emails in the evening and that sort of thing. So there was some talk about not sending emails after five o'clock, for example, um, which, which is not interesting enough. I found that idea terrifying, you know, that I wouldn't be able to get send, send and receive emails after five o'clock because that's interfering with how I tend to sort of run my day. Yeah. So very yes. small initiatives always, you know, the narrative is about health and well-being. It's certainly not about the deeper concerns with their consumption. And it's interesting, you know, when, when I've talked about slowdown, and as I say, the, the evidence for this is, is mounting, um, in discussions like this, people can get, um, can get actually angry. You know, it's such, mm. it's, it's such a sort of, um, not an anathema, but, but so implausible to them that this is what's happening. I think Danny Dawling sums this up best, where he says, but it's, it's kind of like we're on a, you know, this notion of constant technological acceleration, that we're on a train, looking out of the window and the scenery is whizzing by as we whiz towards the future and new technologies yes. etc etc yes. but we don't notice that yes the train is accelerating still accelerating but the rate of acceleration is declining and it's almost because it's imperceptible you can't bring yourself to believe it but when you look at the numbers and when you look at the actions of some of the large companies um it's kind of self-evident. I mean, take Apple, for example, they must be sitting now, my figures for 2014, they must be sitting on like 20 to 30 billion in bank accounts. They're not investing it in technology because there's no return on technology. Why is that? Because people aren't consuming technology. So I mean, if you look at your iPhone, it's been, it, it's looked the same and does the same mm -hmm. for the last decade, right? Technology is not advancing at the rate that we think it is. Um, be a, you know, a Boeing, for example, you know, rather than invest in new technology, uh, just buys back its own shares. That's how it uses its profits. So the old kind of Protestant capitalist system of reinvesting for the future in capital is not happening anymore, or it's at least slowing down because, you know, these producers can see that the, that the demand for their products is just going to continue to stagnate. That was a big answer to a smaller question. I apologize for that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one thing that I question is, so for the context that we want to slow down our consumption overall, and as part of that, slow down our computational needs, how does that match with a world where you have increasingly pervasive computation, more and more sensors everywhere, more and more servers doing stuff with the data they collect from the sensors that individuals might not be truly aware of. You know, I think That's a lot of people, they, they just buy a car. It, it, it just so happens these days That's that true. car will yeah. also have various sensors on the back and tell you where you are and have GPS connections. Yeah. So how, how then does the individual engage in, in slow computing if actually they're 
ever more enmeshed yeah. in this planetary computation system. There's not a lot you can do. You're, you, and, th and this is the problem with um, what Langdon Winner talks about, which is um, centers of control. You know, we, we don't have control over the centers of production. And of course, you know, a, a car now is more expensive uh, relative to income than it was in Henry Ford's day. You know, the, the, the original cars, the model, um, what was it, the Model T Ford or the Model, the model T, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, they were more affordable relative to your income. And the reason for that, of course, is although, although production has got much more efficient, they've not allowed that to uh, impact on their profits. So, of course, they built more and more and more um, computing into cars, just being one example. You know, cars, of course, have got safer. But uh, we also have to pay for the computing that goes with them. And some of it is, is kind of crazy. I mean, how, you know, how, how often are you really going to push your car to involve traction control in reality? Um, aircraft is a wonderful example. You know, you know, airliners are basically robots. You know, they could fly from airport to airport without any interference from a pilot. Uh, not a problem. And in fact, when pilots have interfered, when things have gone wrong, except when sensors have been damaged, it causes more problems uh, than, than it solves. Um, and yet aircraft still have two pilots in them not even just one pilot, but two, and they have big salaries. So there's a huge cost to the airlines, despite the fact they've had to pay for aircraft, which is loaded with all of this digital capability. Um, so, this, so we're going to continue to have this digital capability foisted on us, whether we want it or not. I mean, the airlines at no point turned around and said, well, we don't need aircraft that can do this, you know, stop building them. But the centers of power are able to do this because there are so few manufacturers. Had a couple of questions come through. So yep. one is, would you attribute the four-day work week experiments as a side effect of the of the of the oh, really tripping over that sentence there? Would you equip? Uh, <laughs> what is wrong with me? It's been a long weekend. It's been a it's been a long weekend. I'm sure as we yes it has, it has. So would you attribute the four-day work week experiments as a side effect of the excess productive capabilities? Yes. Or would you perhaps say it's enabling it? Um, it's a side effect of it. You know, at, at, at the end of the day, you know, industry is just, it has overcapacity. So it makes perfect sense to reduce uh, the working week. Why would you not do, you know, why would you not do that? And of course, automation has played a huge role in uh, the way in which factories work. So actually, you know, many of these workers perhaps are surplus to requirement and that's also a risk that we're facing but yeah i would say that you, you, your your feeling around that is correct and i would agree this is about over over productive capacity i'm interested in your points around the mindset and the anger that you uh, might sometimes get giving this talk or, or one similar to it you mentioned the protestant work ethic earlier i mean so much of people's identity is bound up in their work Yes. Uh, it could be the job itself or even just the simple fact that they have a job. It's not just their identity, it's, it's also the way other people view them if they, if they don't. I'm reminded of, I know he died relatively recently, uh, and I can't pronounce his surname, but I think it's Graeber and the, the book Bullshit Jobs. Oh yes. All of these yes. meaningless shuffling of, of not even yes. paper, just sort of digital, yes. digital yeah. documents in order to justify things that actually aren't, aren't really needed. Yes. Keynes wrote you know, thought that we would have the four day working week or less uh, earlier than now. This is sort of slowly creeping in. Do you think there's ever a world that could emerge where people embrace the four day working week or less and, and do as I, I think Marx wrote about, uh, you know, someone doing this painting in the morning and fishing in the evening. Right. Do you think anyone could ever actually want to do this? Or do you think this is just a utopian uh, pie in the yes. sky thing? Pe people find other, other things of value to compete over. It's a, it's a great question, I th and I think you sort of answered it at the beginning with, with bullshit jobs. Um, and I think, you know, there's a huge percentage of people, I can't remember what it is, but it's, it's, it's something like 60 or 70% of people believe their jobs are utterly worthless. You know, so if you're, if, if you're an academic churning out papers that only other academics read so that you can get promoted on the back of them, uh, if you work in advertising or PR or you're a management consultant, um, your job is bullshit. I mean, it's just, it serves no real <laughs> purpose, and you and you feel and you know that. Surely that's worse, you know, doing that five days a week. Surely that's worse than finding something else productive to do with your time. Uh, my uh, colleague is a medic, and he's 
of that generation, of the boomer generation, to be very lucky to be able to retire at 55. And mm. within, within six months, he was bored to tears. So he went back to work for two days, not because he needed the money. And he got involved in all sorts of environmental uh, activism up in uh, Newcastle. And he's, he's now done public speaking and he's completely got a new skill set around doing that. I think he's even written a short paper that's been published on the not peer review journal. But so yes, it's definitely possible. I think you need, I think you probably need imagination. You probably need good education. And I think, um, you know, the, the, the structures have to be out there for to, to allow you to do that, the clubs and societies and the activities and the, mm. you know, because we're, I, I think as human beings were, it's, and our lockdown has showed that, it's certainly showed it to me personally. It's very easy just to sit in the house and, and just work and just do other stuff, you know. It was, yes. There's not, it feels like there's not much out there to get, in, to get engaged with. You know, we need to, you know, the old society of, you know, clubs and friendly societies, et cetera, et cetera. We need to find a way back to that a little bit because we're such collective. They, they, they in turn creatures. were all, those clubs, the collective societies, the working men's groups and churches, they were all structured around a very different society where, you know, you worked in a factory or you worked in a group in a mine or in a field. Yeah. yeah. So the entire life, yes. yes, yes. And had to be regulated in certain ways in order to get what you needed done. Yeah. But if the whole mode of production is different, then you don't need those communities. No, they're frag well, they're fragmented, aren't they? And, um, and yeah. of course, you know, I mean, the whole sort of kind of welfare state in a way came out of the, the, these, these collectives originally, you know, these friendly societies where you put a bit of money aside and you were then protected against unemployment. You know, our whole welfare yes. state grew out of that. So, you know, they had a huge influence, but... And the need know, to herd people into cannons so they could be healthy <laughs> before you did so. That's right, yes. We've had, um, we've had a, another question come in. Uh, pleased to hear, which is, um, would you please reference your book again, please? What's it called? Uh, Slow Computing by Danny Dawling. Uh, sorry, uh, Slow Down by Danny Dawling. And this one, uh, which is a uh, slow computing. And I'm sorry oh. to say it's it's not my book. It's the reading that I've been doing. Ah. Excellent. Okay. Well. Yeah, there's a lot to think of. Have you read, um, it, Kate Crawford wrote a book called Anatomy of AI. I know she wrote a, like a paper with an excellent graphic that's since been turned into a book called Anatomy of AI. Have you come across this? I haven't actually. The name does, actually the name does ring a bell and so does the title, but I haven't read it. It's, uh, it's, it was, uh, I'm sure, it, I doubt any of the ideas would be particularly new to you, uh, but it was certainly a very good introduction to it for a sort of layman as myself. It has this, it has a wonderful diagram of just saying how every artifact takes something that's completely work a day like this, mm. how it embeds you in just a full planet of stuff. You know, everything oh, nice. from the yes. um, from the tungsten and coal, coal time required to go into it, then all the, all the environmental impacts that has, right the way through to the carbon emissions uh, had in the, had through the computation within the servers each time you send an email. Sort of saying this, this this entire world of relations called into being and sustained by use of this, and which of course endeavours to be self-sustaining and growing, thus sucking in more and yes. more and more. Yes. Well worth checking out. I think you'd like it. I think I would read that. And another book I'd recommend is um, it's uh, Floridi's. Uh, I think it's the Fourth Revolution. Yes. Um, yes, I have that one. That was yeah. one of the first things that got me into technology. Actually. There you go. Fantastic. I love the idea that AI is just incredibly stupid. Yes. 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 But also not. I think that there's some really good things about AI, but it's not what we think it is. He said, hedging his bets. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, it's been a lot of really fun. Interesting, interesting talk. If you want to hang around the uh, panels, lovely to have you, uh, not the panels, the, uh, the Slack chats. For the rest of the hackathon, it'd be lovely to have you with us. We're, everyone's hard at work uh, sorting out their remaining submissions which we put through at the end of today. So yeah, thanks very much. Great. And I look Thank forward you. to chatting more uh, as we continue with the Eastern Energy Project. Likewise, yes. Ciao. All right. Bye. Cheers. Cheers.